So the new PES Win magazine came out, uh, and I, I just received it. If you haven't gotten your copy, just go to PESWin.com and, and you can just read it online. This thing is full of really good articles. Uh, the the one I saw and I was looking through, and I, th I thought of Rosemary, was this article by Hitachi Energy because they were they were discussing about HVDC and how that is going to get implemented wider and wider. And some of the the uh, government decisions and the policy and regulatory environment and interest rates are playing into things like Hitachi developing newer and newer systems. And I thought, wow, this is really pertinent to a lot of discussions we've had on, on uptime of, over the last several weeks. If you haven't seen the new PES Win magazine, uh, go get it at, at PESWin.com because it, it's just full of great information. Rosemary, there's been a big push in the United States to decarbonize cement factories. And I think that push is happening all around the world. And I, I know you've been doing a little more of a deep dive on it than, than I have. Uh, do you want to describe what is happening in the cement world? Yeah, well, cement is, last time I checked, it's about 8% of global emissions. Cement being the like glue that goes inside concrete. So everywhere you see concrete, then, um, yeah, the, the, the main... Structural component to that is cement, and also that's the main contribution to its emissions. And it's usually lumped in the, I mean, it's always lumped in the hard to abate category of um, emissions because it's not like decarbonizing electricity, you know, you can um, use renewables instead of fossil fuels and uh, decarbonizing transport. A lot of that is just going to be swapping out electric cars for fossil fuel powered cars. With cement, the emissions don't mainly come from burning fossil fuels. 60% of the emissions are actually process emissions because to make cement, you take um, calcium carbonate, which is limestone, and you need to um, yeah, you, you need to turn that into lime. So you turn limestone into lime and the chemical reaction releases CO2. So it's CO2 that's been trapped underground in a, in a fossil. You know, limestone is essentially fossilized sea creatures. Um, and then you've got to release that CO2. And so it's like a non-negotiable part of that chemical reaction. And cement isn't the only thing that uses lime. Lime's used in a lot of different industries, but anywhere that you have, um, you turn limestone into lime, you've got CO2 that's being released and there's just no way around that. So um, the technologies that people are looking at to address this include carbon capture. That's um, one of the simplest ideas. And in fact, carbon capture is, is better suited to cement production than most other places where people are considering carbon capture because the CO2 is quite concentrated, um, you know, compared to how it is in, a, you know, in a, a fossil fuel power plant. Usually the CO2 is only coming out, you know, maybe 10, 15 percent of the flue gases are CO2. So it needs to be concentrated and in the cement plant, it's much higher. Um, and I was actually recently, a few weeks ago, I visited an Australian company, Calix, uh, who have a, a new kind of calciner, which is a, basically an oven or a kiln that is used to make this reaction from limestone into lime. Um, and they're doing it a bit differently instead of getting the, it needs about 900 degrees Celsius, instead of getting that with a, a flame right in the middle next to the, the ground up raw meal. They're heating it indirectly mm -hmm. from uh, they got a, a big metal tube. They heat it up from the outside. They heat it hot enough that it starts to glow and radiate and then the material inside breaks down um, and the CO2 is released. But because you're not burning something inside it, um, it, it doesn't get all mixed in with other stuff. You basically get a, a very close to completely pure CO2 stream coming out. So you don't need separation technology. You just need to grab the CO2 and, um, yeah, take it away, do something else with it. Um, yeah, so that's that's one option, either traditional uh, CCS or, or this kind of new CCS from Calix. And then there's a few other technologies as well in play, um, some American startups that are looking really interesting. There's um, actually there might be Canadian, I can't remember exactly, but say North American. Uh, Carbon Cure take CO2 that captured from, from somewhere else and then they use that in the... Um, in the concrete curing process, they add CO2, so it's being sequestered and also improves the chemical properties. Um, there's another company called Sublime who are making uh, something that is 
chemically identical to Portland cement, but it doesn't ever start. It doesn't start from limestone. So it starts from um, materials that never had that CO2 to be released. So you can end up with something chemically identical without having to release any CO2. Um, so that's interesting. And then some of the biggest gains are, are going to be made with actually getting better at specifying how much cement we need to use because it's, you know, it's such a cheap and versatile material. It's, you know, it's everywhere. Everyone that lives in a city knows how ubiquitous um, concrete and cement are. But um, it's often used in applications where you could, could use something else instead or you could use less of it. So there's a big push to, yeah, to make sure that all the... I don't know, building codes and civil codes around bridges and whatever are actually specifying um, performance rather than telling you exactly how that you're going to make it. Um, and that, you know, the aim is that you will be able to use less. Rosemary, has there, have there been uh, demonstrator projects to evaluate these processes and materials? Yeah. So, um, well, the so I was visiting... Um, Calyx in their facility near Melbourne. So I saw the several stages of, of calciner. The you know, calciner is the word for the kind of furnace oven kiln, whatever you want to call it, big hot tube. Um, they've been through several different iterations and they have some projects in Europe now in traditional, you know, existing cement manufacturing facilities where they are replacing um, bits of it at a time. So they're already reducing emissions there, um, and the yeah the the cement that comes out the the end is is identical. You know they do all the quality testing, so that's pretty pretty far advanced and ready for scale up. It, it's a cool technology because it's very modular. Um, you know they've got one one size tube at the moment, and that's you know small scale uh, in terms of the um, throughput of a a traditional cement manufacturing facility, but to scale up, they just need more of the same tube. They don't need to, uh, yeah, everything is the final size by now. So it will just be a matter of, of rolling out more of them. Um, yeah. So that's pretty cool. When do you think you'll, we'll see wind turbine foundations using these new processes and materials? Um, I haven't seen anybody that has actually commented on uh, their procurement of concrete. You, you could have it immediately. I think one reason why it might not be as fast as you might think, because it sounds obvious, right? Like a wind turbine manufacturer, of course they should, you know, they're really worried about their supply chain and everything. Um, a lot of them have net zero commitments. They've been through all their factories and sourced renewable electricity and, um, you know, all that sort of thing. But the way that wind farms are rolled out, usually the foundation is done by a local a local engineering company. It's not the wind turbine manufacturer that does it. And so the emissions from it aren't on their books necessarily. Um, well, I mean, they're not on the wind turbine manufacturer's books. Maybe the developer or the owner of, of it would, would care in the end, but um, there is a bit of a separation there that probably doesn't make it as early a target. But it's one of my hopes for the industry for, yeah, for concrete but also for other materials like steel I, I would love to see governments support these new technologies that are needed by procuring the green alternatives because uh, in oh, I don't know everything that I've looked at there are green alternatives they cost more sometimes a lot more sometimes just a little bit more um, but the way that technologies get cheaper and by where that that what Bill Gates calls a green premium, you know, the amount of extra cost that you have to add on top for a green version of something compared to a fossil fuel version, um, the way that that shrinks is by having more and more and more of of that product rolling out. And you know, in terms of um, concrete, like that's governments are one of the biggest procurers of, of that. You think of all the urban concrete that's out there um, in footpaths, uh, sidewalks, um, I don't know, bridges, def def defense, yeah, roads. It's just um, it, there's a real opportunity to, to make a difference if they would start um, procuring that way. And it's easier than forcing, <laughs> forcing it on, you know, private companies who usually don't like to be told what to do. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say that that's the, uh, that's a big opportunity actually to support these, uh, new technologies, which exist. I mean, in a lot of cases, I mean, cement's never, it's never going to be like 
you know, like wind energy is cheaper than, you know, a coal power plant in, in most places or electric cars are also going to be one day cheaper than um, buying a, a petrol car. Cement with carbon capture is never going to be cheaper than just letting it out into the atmosphere. But, um, you know, the so it's always going to be a, a, an economic challenge to actually, you know, ha you have to want to do it. It's not just going to, the technology won't take care of itself. So it is going to need some government support. And I think that that's a, yeah, that's a really way, good way to support it and get that green premium to shrink as fast as possible. You're onto something there though, definitely to, Rosemary, like in the United States, uh, a lot of these big heavy highway projects, right? Like, so if you're building a residential home and there's a crew and we're pouring concrete, if we pour a, uh, 20 or 30 yards in a day for a floor and maybe 20, 30 yards for walls or something. That's a big pour, 40, 50 yards a day. Like that's massive for a residential construction crew. <clears throat> Go to a heavy highway project and they're pouring thousands of yards a day. That money comes from the government to pay for all those things. So if, they, if there's a place that you want to get to an economy of scale, then those projects could be that that Trojan horse to get some of this stuff to reduce the cost. Because I mean, if you're if you're repaving like a, you know a highway, chunk of a highway from say Austin to San Antonio, there's hundreds of thousands of yards of concrete there, more than they'll pour residentially for years in that area. So there's a, there's a vehicle there for it. Yeah, I think so too. For steel as well. I mean, all sorts of all sorts of things. I, I would much rather see government supporting in that way than you know, some of the other <laughs> support mechanisms that they have chosen. Rosemary, you had a video a couple of months ago, if I remember correctly, that was talking about reducing emissions from cement. And since you have visited this factory, are you going to have an, a new video coming out about it? Yeah, yeah. There's, um, I've just got the nearly final edit from um, from my, my editor. And because he's European, he's about to go off on holidays for three weeks. So um, the, <laughs> the the final, final version will will come out after that. Well, that that'll be interesting. So everybody, just check out Engineering with Rosie. You'll you'll see the the factory tour and how we're going to decarbonize cement. That's fascinating. Thanks, Rosemary. <laughs>